from this uh, disease since its inception. In Washington, D.C., we have about close to 13,000 of the residents living with the disease. Um, the city has one of the highest new HIV diagnoses in the country at 42 cases per 100,000 of the population. Social determinant of health remains a major driver of HIV infection, especially among minority groups. And we believe that neighborhood economic deprivation measures such as the distressed community index will provide a more robust measure of the association between social determinant of health and HIV infection. We in this particular study, we used one of the approach of the social determinant of health, which is the distressed community index, and it uses a tool for measuring the comparative economic well-being of U.S. communities. It utilizes seven socioeconomic metrics and five tiers of community to highlight ground-level disparities across uh, the country. I will go through this. Uh, socioeconomic metrics. So the first one is the number of no high school diploma. That is defined as the proportion of the population whose age is greater than 25 years who does not have a high school diploma or its equivalent. We also have the housing vacancy rate, which is defined as the percent of habitable housing that is unoccupied in the area. Also, we have the proportion of adults who are not working, which is also defined as the percentage of adults between 25 and 54 years who are currently unemployed. We have the poverty rate, which has been defined as a percent of the population living under uh, the poverty line. Five, we have the median income, which is defined as, mid, as household income as a percentage of a metro area median income or as a percentage of the state if uh, it's not a metro area. For the sixth uh, socioeconomic uh, measure, we have uh, the change in employment, which is defined as a defined as a percent change in the number of jobs from 2016 to 2020. And lastly, we have the change in establishment, which is defined as the number of business establishments from 2016 to 2020. We need to take a closer look at the distressed community index so that we can have a better understanding of this uh, robust socioeconomic uh, measure. Here we have a closer look at the first four socioeconomic metrics. Uh, the blue line represents the proportion of people without a high school diploma. Uh, the green represents the proportion of adults who are not working. The uh, purple represents the housing vacancy rate. And if we look at the graph, we can see that as we move from the prosperous communities towards the distressed communities, we have a worsening of the socioeconomic status as we have a uh, higher number of proportion of this community not having high school diploma, higher poverty rate, higher adults, not, not proportion of adults who are not working, and higher um, housing vacancy rate. We also looked at the remaining three measures, which is the median household income, change in employment and change in uh, business establishments. The blue line represents uh, the median household income, the red represents the change in employment, and the green represents the change in establishment. And as like the other, the previous graph, as we move from the prosperous to the distressed communities, we find a worsening of these socioeconomic parameters. In this particular study, we hypothesized that there will be a statistically significant association between community level economic deprivation and the prevalence of uh, HIV in Washington, D.C. 
and looking at the direction of that uh, of that association, we propose that with increasing level of economic deprivation, there will be a corresponding increase in the prevalence of HIV in the city. To test our hypothesis, we utilize the Washington State uh, Inpatient Database to conduct a retrospective analysis of all HIV-associated admissions from January 2016 to December 2019. Uh, here is our flow chart showing that there were total, total admissions that were reported in the Washington, D.C. State Inpatient Data is between January 2016 and December 2019 was about 500,000. Among these patients, however, only 200,000 have completed distress community index uh, data and were therefore utilized for this study. Among these patients with complete DCI data, we have about 9,000 of them having uh, living, being people living with HIV. We, here we highlight uh, the age distribution of patients with HIV in Washington, D.C. And we compare the, this age distribution between people living with HIV and those without HIV and the total population. About 60% of the study population were under the age of 45. However, when you looked at the patients who are people living with HIV, 70% of these patients were between the ages of 45 and 65. And this brings to our, one begins to wonder that if these statistics actually highlight the effectiveness of the current HIV regimen, where patients are more likely to live longer than the previous years. We also could compare the uh, sex agenda distribution. We have a limitation in, in, in the use of the gender distribution because the state inpatient database only reported uh, identification as either male or female. So if looking at that, we find out that the larger proportion of the total population were majorly uh, uh, female at 57.8%, but among patients who are people living with HIV, about close to 56% of them are reported to be uh, female, uh, males. Also, we did uh, a univariate analysis to just compare uh, the race and ethnicity distribution among patients living with HIV as compared to the population. Blacks were about 53% of the population, of the total population, while whites uh, were about 28% and Hispanic were about 12.4%. However, when we looked at patients living with HIV, we found out that they were predominantly more of blacks, about 78% blacks, and about 12.5% of Hispanic, which was almost the same proportional way compared to the total population. But for whites, there were about 28% of whites. This demographics implies that HIV infection in Washington is, is majorly a problem of black male, uh, is, is majorly a problem of black male middle age uh, people in Washington DC. We went ahead to conduct our multivariate analysis to determine the association between the distress community index and the AD, uh, HIV infection in Washington, D.C. And to improve the, the validity of our study, we adjusted for patients' age, we adjusted for patients' agenda, we adjusted for race, we adjusted for other social economic and indicators such as insurance and household income. We also adjusted for lifestyle behavior such as alcohol addiction, substance abuse and smoking. And finally, we, we adjusted for risk factors, traditional risk factors for HIV infection like hepatitis B, sexually transmitted infection, and pre-existing comorbidities in terms of hypertension, diabetes, and obesity. And despite this, we found a significant but non-linear association between the distress community index and the odds of HIV infection. Surprisingly, we found that patient a resident of mid-tier neighborhood had the highest level of HIV infections, followed by the distressed communities, and then the prosperous neighborhoods, however, has the lowest odds of HIV infection. This was contrary to our hypothesis where we were expecting that with increasing and worsening socioeconomic 
condition or de de decreasing uh, socioeconomic deprivation, we expect to have a higher de increase in, 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 in prevalence of HIV. We went ahead to determine how living with HIV or where you live, which we captured in terms of the distressed community, then affects some selected outcomes. These selected outcomes, we looked at how this affects uh, length of hospitalization among all the patients that were admitted in the hospital. We tried to look at how living with HIV or having a particular neighborhood, the social economic status of your neighborhood, affect uh, outcome. And we found that a, we found a significant and linear association between the distress of the index and the length of hospitalization, even when we adjust for hospital discharge disposition, because usually the major cause or the major risk factor for prolonged hospital stay is the disposition, the discharge disposition. But when we control for that, we still found out that the distressed community, residents of the distressed co communities are more likely to stay in the hospital longer than patients who are residents of the of uh, more prosperous uh, neighborhood. However, patients living with HIV were, however, not likely to stay longer in the hospital than their counterparts without the disease. We also examined the association between or the influence of HIV and DCI on hospital mortality, on, on the median hospital charges. We found that we found a significant association, we were a worrying one between these uh, parameters with people living with HIV, more likely to have about $3,000 increase in total hospital charges when compared to other uh, patients. Secondly, as we move from the prosperous to the distressed neighborhood, there is a significant increase in the median house, in the median hospital charges with residents of the distressed neighborhood on incurring about $18,000 increase in hospital charges, more than those living in the prosperous uh, neighborhood. And lastly, we try to find out if there's any association or any influence of HIV and DCI on in hospital mortality. We did not find any association between the HIV or between people, among people living with HIV or distressed community index in the in hospital mortality. And the implication of this is that people living with HIV are not likely to die within 30 days of hospital admission than other patients. There was also no association with, between the neighborhood community. So there, there's a little bit of a limitation we did because we only captured the first 30 days of hospital admission. So we don't know what happens to those patients in the next 60 days, 90 days, or even within a year of a, a hospital uh, admission. In conclusion, we found a significant association between neighborhood economic deprivation and the occurrence of HIV in Washington, D.C. And understanding the places and populations that are most affected by HIV allows the efficient allocation of scarce resources to the geographic areas where they are needed the most. Uh, thank you. I'll be happy to answer your questions. Questions, concerns, recommendations, suggestions? Okay, we'll take you first, then you will next, then you'll be told. Um, excuse me. So, for, uh, for the woman from Access, um, I had a couple of questions. Um, so, having provider mm, lack of response was uh, a roadblock in getting people uh, connected to care. I was wondering if you did any projects specifically for providers to make them more comfortable around providing PrEP um, or more comfortable with doing the sexual history, anything, any kind of projects for them specifically? No, that's what I just wanted to. Um, uh, we're in the process right now of conducting a series of provider interviews 
to more clearly identify what they see as the barriers to PrEP access for our patients uh, as a preliminary result, although we still have some more interviews to conduct, is that they are looking for additional training in how to have some of those discussions. Awesome. And so when you went to the, um, to the everyone gets tested model, mm -hmm. how did that get rolled out and did you get pushback from the providers? It was actually rolled out in phases. We piloted it at initially one or two health centers and then we expanded it uh, to a few well, uh, 10 health centers and then it finally went system wide. Uh, and when that launched, it actually launched with a hard stop BCA, which like put a full stop to everything we encountered because we couldn't do anything and that lasted for two days before they made us take it down. <laughs> um, but that really did get people's attention. Mm -hmm. um, since then we've sort of we made various changes in how that BCA works. We would have it as a hard stop for a month at a time. Um, and then in late 2021 we actually moved from having a separate HIV screening BCA to folding it into the health maintenance topic, which providers can address all of the outstanding health maintenance topics, so the vaccinations, the screenings, all of that with one click. And so our rates have gone up. Got it. Cool, thank you. Taking it easy. Yeah, thank you. Um, you go next. <laughs> <laughs> In a good way. Good to see you. Good to see you. <laughs> Mike, I have a question for um, the West Hollywood team, Aaron and Derek, around your stigma assessment tool. Is that publicly available to share? And do you all possibly have a data snapshot from your last round of data? Uh, so, all the reports that we've provided over the last six, seven years are typically available for the public to download and view, so that the reports, which include the survey and stigma results, are available. And can you repeat the second question? Yes, I was just asking about data, but my, my real second question is around how you all are using those results um, from the stigma assessment in, in particular to make any changes to your organization. Is that as a part of what you all need to do? And what are some of those changes that you've made so I'll, I'll answer part of it and Derek's probably in a better position to, to answer the portion of the modifications to contracts but I know when we've been tracking so part of the survey and stigma includes linkage retention engagement viral suppression and so when we identified what looked like a downward trend we called uh, we called meetings with the service providers, the contract agencies, to ask them, what do you think is going on that may be explaining some of these trends? And are there things that we could do to, to reverse these trends? Uh, meaning, is it, I know the county has a program for re-engagement of people who have fallen out of care. It's a little different in the city of West Hollywood, but we, we just, we opened it up for conversation. And then I think some of the some of the funding priorities shifted a little bit. For example, when <clears throat> when I say shifted, money was found to provide more services for the trans community when they were vocal about some of the some of the issues around stigma that were not being addressed. And other folks can each other. Microphone for this. Um, yeah. So that's an interesting question about how kind of that is translated into a service category. And so with the providers that we contract with, one of the things we ask them to do is come to, get, to do a communications plan for us. And in that communications plan, they uh, tell us how they're going to communicate U equals U. That was one of the things that we highlighted during the HIV Zero initiative. And so it got the providers really thinking about how to communicate stigma with um, their, not only their clients, but with the entire community.
that too much masculine. We definitely need to follow the rules. So, well, we call the kiddos, but there were 25-year-olds who were impatient being treated for HIV, and I would really hate for that to be missed. I also we do understand that for the younger kids, that that population is decreasing, but you still have that very high-risk group right there, the 18 to 25. <laughs> that I think Okay, um, I also have a few questions or maybe suggestions. I don't know if you put me in the right direction. For our second presenter, I was um, hoping to know um, if you conduct the biological um, behavioral survey and how regular it is done in your community, uh, the community is working. I also wanted to know um, what approaches you use for HIV reduction. Do you use um, cohort uh, groups or ITC or things like that? Then uh, for the third speaker, I wanted to ask, since uh, there was the COVID um, incidents, did you think about telemedicine um, in your approach? Did you get that question? I was hoping to know if you consider telemedicine during the, it's fine, during the COVID-19 um, pandemic in your people. That's maybe if you consider that, because I noticed that there was a high um, rise, but it's fine. And then for the first present, I was um, Melissa Wright. Um, I was hoping to know if you had any measures to prevent double counting as it relates to the number of positives recorded. Do you have any any measures to prevent uh, double counting as it is common uh, recording a positive in a delegated 
you on the manner that it's taking them as in like to avoid double counting. Between agencies? Yes. Um, so the, the linkage rates are for newly diagnosed patients. Okay, so are general measures for double counting? Is it for the initial person? It's not recorded in an analysis and things or something like that. Yeah, we're we're depending on, on patient self-report yeah, if they're newly diagnosed or not. Um, we do have a number of patients that are, you know, that have a reactive HIV test and they come in and say, you know, we want to start care at access. And so those patients are not included in those linkage rates. It's only the patients who don't have a previous HIV diagnosis. We are not able to check surveillance records to determine for sure. Um, but anecdotally, I, I do a manual review of patient records and oftentimes the provider will know. Patient shocked and tearful, um, which, you know, isn't a guarantee, but. I can imagine. Okay, so um, lastly, I wanted to know if um, the navigator will follow up on the patient like to ensure that the medications are really taken up. There's no pill counts. Um, the only thing that we can verify, and it's not 100% data coverage, is that we do get some medication dispense data from the pharmacy, uh, but it's it's not for all coverages. But I think we have, well, reasonable coverage. Some is better than none. Um, and they are reaching out to the patients directly to, to document. Thank you. So you want to take your gentlemen? Oh, sir. Uh, the area I talked about um, the behavioral surveillance of you. Is it regular? Is it a regular thing? Yeah. Are you asking me? Yes, sir. <coughs> Can you ask that again? I was talking about the. Do you do IDBSS survey, behavioral um, um, surveys in your community? Do we do behavioral surveys? Yes. As in the target community, like um, you're looking at. I heard you say something about them. What sex with men? How regular do you have a survey in this group? Like, oh, uh, so we have. We have not had one in this in this cycle this year. Okay. Uh, but we have conducted seven of those surveys, and they are conducted every six years. Okay. Uh, I think you may have, you may have heard Derek uh, uh, mention that nearly half of the population in the city identifies as LGBTQ. Uh, what's unique about HIV in Los Angeles County and West Hollywood is that it's 98 percent among men who have sex with men, uh, whereas some of the other regions are different. So in terms of behavior, uh, we, ask, we ask them about their comfort speaking to providers, revealing their sexual practices, like their sex to, to yes, re revealing their, their HIV status to new partners, uh, how often they're using condoms, whether they're getting a PrEP navigation, uh, screening, uh, if they're laterally suppressed. So we ask a variety of questions about that. We ask about uh, stigma and their experiences of it, and when they do have, when they do experience it, in what context, in what setting, who's who's making them feel stigma. So if you do an ITC one on one consultation, one on one discussion, or in a cohort project group, how do you do? How do you do discussions for your your, your behavior change? Is it like in a group session or one on one? As it done? So we at least so. We don't have a behavioral change conversation in terms of what my organization do, does. We're, we're evaluating for the city, and the city has different contract agencies that provide uh, health navigation and behavioral health services and community and group setting uh, therapy sessions and one-on-one. -on -one. So those are the, there's a compendium of services that are contracted for. But for me personally, my organization, we're strictly looking at the data and working with the agencies to make sure that they are able to provide the data in a way that, that, that we need. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. Thank you all. Are there any other questions, suggestions, recommendations, or ways forward? Gentlemen and ladies, that'll be all. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>